Okay, I think we are live. So let me just check the chat. Hi. Uh, if you're on. Hi. Okay. Um, so just checking. Can you hear me? Okay, looks like we're live uh, and we're streaming. In case anyone's on, uh, you know, anyone's already sort of joined the stream, say hi. Yeah. Okay, so we have someone on the stream. Hi, Mihir. Um, so I guess today's talk is actually going to be about. Uh, so I've been working on, or rather, I've been breaking my head about something. Um, it's basically a debugging issue, which we couldn't debug without, um, you know, without a hardware debugger. So I just thought I'll make a quick, short talk on what's called the JTAG interface, or rather the JTAG standard that's used usually in the embedded scene to debug, you know, these these sorts of problems. I wouldn't say hard to debug, but certain type of problems that you'd like to debug because you can't use your general logging or printing uh, style debugging. So let's get quickly started. Uh, so before I start, I hope the font size is you know, good because my computer keeps shifting around. I just want to check, double check. Yeah. Uh, so is the font size okay. All right, cool. So let me get started. So actually, let me just talk about the, you know, the problem statement first. So I have this board called the IMX Nano. Uh, let me sort of just pull it up so that you can see it. Uh, with a good, you know, a good picture of it, maybe. Yeah. So this is the board I have. Uh, this is the board I have, which essentially has the IMX. Uh, this is the IMX Nano board. Actually, it's a repackaging of the IMX Eight Mini board. This is a board from NXP. Uh, it has a bunch of things. It's widely used in many you know, in many commercial products. Um, so I've been working on something along those lines. Now I've sort of run into a problem uh, and it's, it's actually not that big of a problem, but I thought it'd be a good talk to sort of put something out there on this. Uh, if it helps other f folks as well as, you know, I can sort of refer back to it when I, when I need to. So this particular board, you have the chip, which is, uh, it has, it's actually a heterogeneous uh, architecture, you can say, because it's got two different kinds of cores on it. It has the Cortex-A core, and then it also has a Cortex-M core. The M core is the microcontroller, the A core is the application. So today I'm more interested in the A core because that's what I want to actually work with. And then it's got all these peripherals and stuff. It's got a nice little uh, USB 2 um what do you say usb to uart interface that's already provided over here i don't know if you can see this but this is actually an ftti chip that's baked into the board which does the conversion so that's one and then here if you see closely this is my jtag port because this is a development board you also get what's called a jtag board port uh now jtag you know the 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 abbreviation and the name has nothing to do with what it does, but it is what it is. So we'll get into that. So basically, I'm going to be using this particular port to debug this chip because I'm going to be running some code over here. And, you know, I don't even have the UART working yet 
So I'm actually dealing with startup code. In other words, I'm trying to bring up this board. And, you know, this technically my implementation works in something like the Kimu environment and emulator. But when I actually test this on the board, there's something wrong. Uh, I'm on, you know, I don't get any output. So, you know, after having looked at a bunch of options, the only other remaining option was to really get down to connecting to the CPU and figuring out instruction by instructions what's going on. I still have to figure it out. I haven't figured it out. Just thought I'd put a video out there while I'm doing this. All right. Uh, so quick questions. Any, any questions on that? Any questions on the diagram or what we're doing, etc.? Okay. Uh, well, I think not. All right. So let's just get into it directly. So I've sort of put together a little bit of a couple of points. We'll talk about the JTAG standard first. What is this JTAG standard? So the JTAG standard, if I was to sort of talk about it, uh, sorry, not JAT, but JTAG. Uh, yeah. So let's just take a, a very simple image, to sort of simplify things and move along faster. Um, okay, I'll just take this. So yeah, so basically you can think of, uh, okay, it's got an FPGA and all, I don't want to, I don't want to get into that. Uh, just a simple implementation. Yeah, this should do. Okay. Right. I hope you can see this. All right. I think you can see this. So what happens here is we've got, um, we've got, you can think of these uh, three little boxes as three different devices or three different uh, what the right word is what's called a tap interface that is a test access port in other words these are three different chips that are present on the same board maybe and you want to actually um, sort of interrogate those chips or debug those chips you know you want to figure out whether the connections between, let's say, this chip and this chip, or this chip and this chip, that's one and two or zero and one, whether the, the interconnections between them are working and they're fine, there's no, like, uh, you know, the connections are not broken or some particular uh, latch is not working, etc. All of those things usually you'd want to test. Now that's from a, uh, Usually that's from an electrical engineering perspective. It's not from a software engineering perspective, but from an electrical engineering perspective, you'd want to actually think about it. And JTAG was actually invented or rather came out when, you know, I'm not going to go into the history and all, where previously they didn't have this option of being able to test any piece of circuitry on the board using just four pins. They had to actually have multiple pins for all the uh, connections that you exposed and they had this setup called a bed of nails thing etc and you had to do it but later on JTAG came out because it was one interface that connected all of the internal components with just four signals it's called the, the, the test clock the test mode selector the test data out and the test data input with just these four pins or rather signals you would be able to uh, read in or read out data from any of those components that are present on a system on a chip. Right? Make sense? Right? Yeah, because yeah, this is what you call uh, a JTAG chain. And I mean, we'll anyway see it when we sort of run the command as well that what is the JTAG chain uh, but I hope that makes sense so you have multiple devices that are actually sort of chained together or rather daisy chained together 
uh, and you all, all you need is four different wires that are actually going through where you can put data in and you know you can basically put in a request and then you can pull the request out using this these four pins okay so good that makes sense uh, now that's just starting out like how does that look what does that mean we know that this is uh, this is what it looks like which means you just saw the uh, you, you saw this diagram you saw that the port looks like this this is i mentioned four pins but there are 10 pins over here um, so technically you only need four pins the other pins are usually for ground and other options that they provide but you also have a 20 pin connector which will again again the same thing you don't need if you're just using it for jtag you just need four pins right you don't need more than that um, so in a nutshell JTAG is an interface that allows you to debug or rather um, yeah basically debug and program your hardware um, it was originally invented not to debug or program it was originally invented to sort of scan the hardware to say that there are all the connections are in place nothing is broken nothing is you know out of place etc but later on they discovered that you know you can use the same thing the same architecture or the same debug infrastructure the wires that is to do also debugging and programming and i will spend some time talking about that which is what is this you know how does it what does it look like so it's actually a very simple thing that's why i thought you know i, I will actually spend time uh, so okay um yeah maybe something that's just simple you want to say, okay i'll just take this yeah this is sort of the simplest way of looking at things um i hope you guys can see this uh where is that yeah i hope you guys can see this yeah just check the chat you can see this i think you can according to my screen you should be able to see it but just double checking because these images are quite compressed i don't know if they're like clearly visible or not okay yeah all right so think about it this way i mentioned those four pins the tdi the tdo so the tdi goes you know basically assume that this is one of your cpu cores okay just assume that's one then you have a signal processor maybe part of your board you also have an fpga that's built into the board these are these are three distinct chips that are sort of baked into your board that's where the heterogeneous architecture comes from you have multiple different cores that are sort of on the same board you use them for different purposes sometimes they communicate with each other all of that stuff but if you have a problem on such a complex system uh, how do you debug it on the hardware level you can use the jtag port and the jtag port exposes this pin so what happens is this particular look at this pin which is the tdi it connects it has a connection these are the these pins that you see these uh, these yellow ones uh, those are your, the you know the individual cores own pins like this cpu has its own input output whatever they are the, these yellow blocks now in between them what you have are called boundary scan cells in other words that's exactly what uh, that's that is part of the the jtag infrastructure inside the inside these boards so the tdi connects all of these little cells and look at that all of these cells are actually connected in series if you're able to see this right they're all connected in series i'm sorry i cannot draw it and then uh, but you know i hope you can actually see this and then they all sort of uh, connect out to the tdo so all of them are sort of connected uh, that's what we call a shift register and i'll talk about that shift register but so far that is does that that makes sense right Okay, there's a question that's saying, are you using JTAG or DAP? 
So uh, JTAG is basically a standard. Debug access port is something that is provided by the ARM standard. So ARM's implementation of you know, its debug and trace, uh, yeah, yeah, its debug and trace standard that it has, it supports both. It supports JTAG as well as what is called SWD. SWD is something that ARM has come up with by itself. You don't need more pins, so it's you know it's much cheaper. You don't have you don't have to like uh, spend more to put this JTAG in there. That's kind of why they came out with it, and it's actually more performant in the ARM world. But the debug access port, um, yeah, JTAG will use the debug access port to communicate with any ARM. Um, board or chip or whatever, right? That makes sense. But yes, so far in uh, in this case, uh, does that make sense? Where we're talking about, you know, what this architecture is. We have this TDI pin that goes in and comes all the way out in the TDO pin, right? That makes sense, right? Okay, I think that makes sense. So that's what we call a shift register. So what actually happens is, so I'm not going to actually get into the very exact, you know, working because that's actually not important for us. All we need to know is how does it work. So let's sort of focus on that. Uh, so the way it actually works is, um, we have one diagram here that we can probably use, but let me just pull one, yeah, let's just take this. See, I don't have to actually make any of these diagrams because they already exist. Uh, so this is the simplest possible state machine that JTAG works on, okay? All you need to do is, JTAG has this thing called, uh, as you probably saw in the previous example, sorry, where's that? Here, you saw this tap controller thing, right? This tap controller is the one that will actually uh, maintain or drive a st the state machine that I'm going to show you. The state machine is what uh, this whole ta JTAG thing works on. There are 16 states in the JTAG standard, in the, basically in the JTAG uh, standard. And you have to like transition from state to state. You have to be in a certain state to do something, to do some, to perform some action. You have to be in a certain state. And that entire state transition is managed by this thing called the tap controller. The tap controller is part of every single device that is present on the board. Right? Makes sense? Sort of? Questions? Mm, I guess not. No questions? Okay, cool. So, yeah, so I was just saying that if you actually look at this, uh, this particular uh, case, so what happens is let's say I want to move from this state called the test logic reset state. I want to move from this state and let's assume that I want to move to the shift IR state. So you see this over here, it says zero. So I, I set a zero on one of the signals. Basically I set a zero on the main signal, which is called the test mode, you know, uh, the test, the TMS, the t test mode selector. When I set a zero and a one and a one, and then a zero and a zero, I reach this particular state. Right? So here's the simplest way to sort of explain this. In JTAG, what you do is you say that, okay, I want to read from a register or I want to write to a memory location, whatever it is that you want to do. It's an instruction that you have to provide, right? That instruction is provided. So this is the entire instruction state uh, part of the state machine. This is the data state part of the state machine. So you provide an instruction first by just navigating the state machine. And then once that instruction is present in the, you know, inside your, uh, what you call 
inside your instruction register then you start loading your data in so once you've loaded your uh, is that yeah once you've loaded your instruction then you load your data in and then basically what happens is the instruction operates on that data and says okay you are asking me to read data from this chip about this register or whatever it is that you want me to do i'll go ahead and do it and then we'll move the data out the only thing over here is everything is serial so what's actually happening here is uh, if you see this uh, so the way you actually are reading in or reading out data is serially but let's say i move a one in this is one boundary scan cell i have one in over here then if i move another one in it actually moves into the second so the first one moves into the second cell and the second bit comes in to the you know whatever the one b b before it so everything moves along this line or rather these signals that's why it's data is being shifted in or data is being shifted out all right as so far does that make sense i just wanted to sort of give you and in you know a high level overview of the jtag state machine because that people usually get confused when you are trying to connect the wires etc and you think that this is some magic you know method um, you know some magic that's working underneath there's no magic it's a very simple serial you know based on a serial based protocol that uses four sing four separate wires the simplest thing that they do is you you know input an instruction and then you input some data and then the instruction works in that data and then you shift whatever the response is out of your um out of the jtag you know port right okay so so far so good yeah i don't i didn't want to spend too much time because as i said it's 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 great it's nice to know about this but you don't have to delve into it to just start getting working on it uh so any questions before i move on on this part okay Ashwant uh, said yes. Is that a question or? Mm, okay, I assume that's not a question. All right. So, I was also going to sort of talk about the data JTAG instruction, but I think you get the gist of it, like the way you move it. That's what I've mentioned over here. Let's say we have a debug instruction that, uh, you know, basically we want to access and control the internal state of some some device basically you want to access some register in, in some part of the system then uh, you could f in um, by the way in jtag the standard it only mandates certain instructions that means as part of the standard only like three instructions are mandatory the rest of them are dependent on the vendor whoever is making the board or the you know the, the basically the chip so lots of different things can change okay just keep that in mind um, but having said that the this is an example where let's say there is an instruction called the data instruction uh, which allows us to shift in or out 32-bit data that basically uh, you can think of this as the register uh, that you are trying to read or write from and the way you do this is as i mentioned you shift you get to the shift ir state first by moving the you know by uh, basically you know, uh, yeah by basically setting the tms pin on and off depending on you know how many cycles you need to get there uh, and once you do that once you get to the shift ir state which is here i'll just sort of put this in front once you get to the shift ir stage you you can you can stay in the shift ir stage as long as you keep shifting data into the instruction register once you do that then you can come out that is you can move out to the exit and you can move out to the update 
and then you can go back right that's what you know is mentioned over here uh and then the same thing then once you once you've put your instruction in then you say okay if it's a read you don't actually have to you know put any data into it but you'll put dummy data into it so that you can the response can get pushed out of the chip all right okay cool so that is basically what we call you know a very very high level overview of the jtag state machine uh, in case there are you know, interesting questions that you have we could probably do a bit you know another session or so but coming back to the you know the problem that we have at hand i mentioned that there is some particular piece that we need to debug and we don't have you know there's obviously printf is not working because you don't even have a you want peripheral working on your board without that you're not going to be able to print anything right um so the goal is to sort of bring up the board at least to a point where you can printing is working that is you're able to log stuff to the console but that is not happening now so what can we do sorry so what can we do let's go back to the piece okay this is another piece that i wanted to talk about which is the arm debug standard i think this is one of the questions that you know there was a question in the chat so let me actually spend like 5 minutes on this just so that you know you sort of get it so this part i hope you guys can see it yeah i hope you guys can see this you can see this image right let me just check here yeah i think it's visible okay so let me just talk about this uh, thing a little bit so in the arm world arm has provided like when you when you buy in a board from the market when you buy any kind of sort of evaluation kit or whatever it is when it comes with an arm uh, core as such it could be a cortex m core or a cortex a core doesn't matter they have built uh, those cores will contain the you know this infrastructure that we just talked about they will have a debug port which is called the debug interface which will support both the jtag uh, you know standard as well as the serial wire debug standard okay so that debug interface supports both all right and then there's also tracing which i'm not getting into right now but just know that tracing is a scenario where um you know when you debug you normally it's it's not uh, it's a very invasive uh, you know method of debugging wherein you stop execution you start execution you check the registers you examine memory etc but most of the time or in some cases you are working on performance critical code or very time sensitive code etc and you know you can't really stop execution in those cases tracing really helps why you can you can just basically turn this tracing infrastructure on it will trace all of the instructions that your program is executing and then offline you can sort of do the analysis to see okay what is going wrong where okay that's basically tracing but that's separate let's talk about the debug part in the debug part you will have many pieces like you'll have a breakpoint unit you'll have a memory access unit whatever they are these are all resources that are available to you Uh, and you can access them through the debug interface okay so in the arm world uh its debug and trace infrastructure is called core site okay that's what uh, i mentioned here it's called core site and as i mentioned over here dap or debug access ports is an implementation of this you know arm debug interface standard whatever you're seeing over here uh this is the the specification saying this should do this this should do this this is what you need this is what you don't need etc now an actual implementation of that is dap right um then the next piece is what does dap actually do what does the specification actually provide a bunch of registers and then the pins that you need to expose basically the jtag pins that you need to expose or the swd pins you need to expose and the registers that you need to enable this interface all right and then after that you also need something called the access ports access ports are basically these resources whatever resources you have in 
you know once you have your debug port up and running you want i want to connect to this i want to check this resource i want to check that resource i want to check the cores i want to check the memory bus i want to check the peripherals attached all of that stuff all right so the debug port is providing the external physical connection which is this part all right and the access port is providing specific resources on the device such as memory registers etc right any question on that part on this part to do okay cool then that makes sense now that you know a we've covered sorry let me just go back we've covered the sorry yeah we've covered the jtag standard just a very high level overview of the tap controller and the state machine and also an example of you know let's say you want to do a when one instruction is you would want to execute one instruction in the tap standard what happens we also looked at the arm debug interface now let's look at gdb i don't know if we'll have time for scripting but we'll just talk about the scripting portion uh, but so in gdb what happens is first let me show you what is my setup um, so i have this uh, okay i've got this little board actually i have the exact same setup let me just pull this setup so can everybody see this okay it's not there's not a good picture uh, i think this should be visible okay can you guys see this yes this this image is visible it's not grainy and stuff because i just wanted to show you a couple of things on the that's on the image um all right so this particular board contains an ftdi chip all right now ftdi is a company uh, it's based out of the uk i guess uh, they are really awesome because they've made uh, they've come out with something called their new their technology called mppsc uh, it's multi protocol synchronous serial engine basically it's a fancy way of saying that you can handle pretty much any serial protocol and i just mentioned that jtag is a serial protocol right and single wire debug is also a serial protocol so this particular uh, board or rather element will enables us to actually use it as a probe to connect to that debug port that i was talking to you about so you can use this board to connect to your um you know imx8 jtag port of course this has a usb on one end that connects to the computer and then there's a pin out specifically that you need to sort of plug in i hope i can show it to you i don't know if it's uh, yeah i have way too many wires i just don't want to disturb it so that i can show you what it works but you just take take my word for it cuz uh, i'll show you another example maybe uh yeah actually you know what this thing is in present here right okay yeah so this board actually has it for example if you see um on this board there are pins that are marked ad0 which is digital 1 digital uh, digital 0 1 2 3 those pins are your clock input output and mode selector okay so basically it supports jtag and the board only costs i think like 
in Indian currency, it costs about 700 rupees. So it's pretty cheap. Generally, if you wanted something like this, if you want something like from uh, a debug probe, you will need to spend thousands of rupees. That's not the case. You can actually use this. Um, so that's the low cost part about what I was talking about. Uh, so the way this, the setup works is you have, let me show you the setup. Uh, okay, I didn't have a diagram. Oh, let me just see if I can find you a diagram. Okay, let's take this. This, this is a good diagram. Yeah, so this is a pretty good one. So this board is using the JTAG port to connect to the Raspberry Pi's JTAG interface. Now the Raspberry Pi does not have a separate JTAG interface like my board, which is the NXP IMX8. Its own GPIO pin sort of multiplex the JTAG port. They are available on the GPIO header itself. So that's what he's connected them to. Now, once you connect them up, this becomes your debug probe. The way it works is, so this is your computer. You connect your computer to this probe and the probe is doing all the serial, you know, managing the state machine, you know, taking your, uh, taking, taking your requests, whatever requests you put in. I'll show you how you put those requests in. It's using GDB, that's where the debugger comes in. You put in those requests and then it takes those requests and sort of, you know, sends out those serial commands. The instruction register is filled, the data registers are filled, then pulls, shifts the data out, all of that stuff is done in the uh, FTD, uh, you know, board. This board is the FTD I232H. Uh, it's a very simple board, a very cheap board, and you can basically get to do JTAG debugging with it. You can also do serial wire debug, as I just mentioned. Okay, so I hope that is sort of, sort of clear, right? It's not rocket science, very straightforward. Okay, so now when we come to this, the last part that I wanted to mention was the way this works is you have a compiler, you write your code, you compile your code. Now in our case, it's Rust, you write Rust, you compile it with the Rust compiler, you get Rust code, you know, basically you get whatever, assembly code for your architecture. And then you have what is called a GDB client. The GDB client is something that's going to be running on your host machine, which is your laptop or your computer. Then you also have OpenOCD, which is your GDB server. Now there are many kinds of GDB server options available. One of them, the, you know, the most heavily used one is the open source one, which is OpenOCD. The most well-supported commercial implementation is by JLink, which is basically from a company called Segar. They provide what's called the JLink GDB server. All right. That one is like really professional. It's got all the cool bells and whistles, etc. But it works with their probes only, which is a JLink probe. So each of these uh, GDB servers support a bunch of different uh, probes, like a bunch of different FTDI chips type. So you can have FTDI chips, you can have other kinds of probes, etc. whatever. Whoever's making a probe that, that is, can do this uh, JTAG state machine management, uh, you could probably use their software. OpenOCD supports a wide range of them, all right? OpenOCD, OpenOCD supports a lot of these debuggers. OpenOCD also supports JLink, sorry, uh, Sega uh, probes, all of that. But JLink uh, usually only supports its own probes. I don't know if they support other ones, etc. PyOCD currently is a Python implementation of the GDB server, but it only supports Cortex M plan, you know, probes. Uh, it doesn't, uh, sorry, it only supports Cortex M debugging Cortex M systems. It supports probes that debug Cortex M systems. So that's the limitation over there. So basically, you'll have to sort of look at it. What they do is what GDB server does, as I've explained over here, is on one end, they will implement or expose the GDB ser serial protocol, which is what your GDB 
client is going to be using to talk to your GDB server. Then your GDB server on the other end needs to talk to the probe, right? So that is the, sep is the second piece. So that's all it needs to do. It's sitting in between and sort of interfacing between you and the probe. Okay, make sense so far? Yeah, questions? Okay. Yeah, looks like the again theory took me like 45 minutes. I really need to work on my theory. Uh, anyway, so basically what can you do with all of this? Effectively, what are we trying to do? You can go ahead and use this debugging method, the hardware debugging method, to a set breakpoints in your execution, read and write registers that are CPU registers, read and write from memory, detecting whether a CPU has been halted, etc. You can also use it to program the, the non-volatile memory, which is in most cases is flash or EMMC, etc. You can also do that. That's what a debug probe with OpenOCD and GDB allow you to do, right? Make sense? Okay, now without further ado, I wanna quickly actually show you at least one demo because I don't know how much time I have. I'd like to really wrap it up. Uh, so I hope uh, the terminals are sort of um, clear. I think it's clear enough. So let me actually pull this up. So uh, I've actually run this before, so I've got it working. It took a little while to sort of get this working because the pin connection was a little tricky, uh, but now that's working, it's, it's fine. Uh, so I've got my FTDI chip connected to my JTAG port. Uh, and by the way, this JTAG port is the 10 pin port, which means there's a, the port is smaller so you need a specific connector. Uh, so just, yeah, just keep that in mind if you're going to be working on with 10 pin connectors, those cables are pretty rare and they're not easy to find. Uh, now, let me just uh, quickly um, just pull in, just connect to my debugger. All right, that's my hardware probe. Let me just connect to that. In order to connect to that, I am basically going to go ahead and spin up my GDB server. As I said, you have, you have three things in between. Uh, you have your computer that uses GDB, the debugger. You have the GDB client, which is the GDB, and that connects to GDB server. GDB server is the one that's actually sort of communicating with your probe. And your probe in turn communicates with the JTAG. So there's so many levels actually. So let's go connect, let's go spin up our GDB server. And uh, since because this is, I need root access for this, I'm just going to. Okay, uh, right now you saw that what happened over here is I haven't turned on my board, so my board is not powered up. So you will now, this is where it makes sense to actually understand the JTAG state machine and you know, really look at all of that. So you will see an error that says JTAG scan chain failed, all zeros were returned. So technically, what it's looking for is. If the board was powered on, then you would have scanned your, you, I just uh, spoke about what a scan chain is. It's all those, you know, different uh, components that are part of your board uh, that are wired together. So that entire thing is called the JTAG scan chain. So what my probe did is it's connected to the board, but since the board is not powered up, it's going to fail. And that's why it's sort of giving you an example as well and saying, check the, you know, check your board, is everything working or not, right? That's what it's asking for. And then you also see some other errors saying there's a capture error, etc. So the board tried to move the state machine forward, but it exactly failed when it tried to uh, move it into the first, one of the first states, which is the IR capture state. So it was supposed to work, but it didn't work is what it's saying. So the reason I spoke about the state machine is because of this. 
when you start when you wire up your thing and you see these errors you'll be like what the hell is that right now it doesn't make a lot of difference because you know that it's a simple state machine you just need to know you know which part is not working correctly and in this case it clearly says that there's something wrong with your connection or your setup please check again so let me just turn on the board and clear the screen and this time you see i've gone ahead and uh, connected i've basically gone ahead and asked my board to look for uh, my imx8 uh, board and then what it does is it basically went ahead and found a device this particular part right it found a device the device uh, it has one id mechanism that it uses that's all implementation dependent right so for the probe that i have open ocd has a driver open ocd the, how, that's how open ocd communicates with the ftdi chips all right and that's where by the way the command that you see over here is there are two things that i provide i provide a configuration file for my board which is the probe then i provide a configuration file for my board now both those configurations together are provided to open ocd then it uses that configuration to set up you know to set all the right bits in the right way and then make those requests to the probe okay any questions on this all right i guess no questions on this right okay i guess not so let me uh, just jump in to the next part now what do i do as i said this is my gdb server it's running it's connected to my probe and my probe is communicating with the board great now all i need is i will now need to uh, so yeah i haven't shown you one important thing um, so right now the board is just running whatever code it has on it it's running there's nothing that's been interrupted etc it's just that our gdb server is you know it sort of has a view but it is not there's no there are no breakpoints set up there's no debugging actually happening in order for you to actually debug you need to be able to uh use a debugger and gdb comes in over there by the way i am going to be uh this is the simplest code that i wrote that i actually want to debug so it's very very simple it's the simplest program that you can see so i'm basically what am i trying to do i'm trying to run some code on the device which is the imx8 chipset now the imx8 board actually has its own custom boot flow it looks for a header in a and the header has to have a particular format bunch of different fields it needs to have so when the board gets booted the rom code is going to look for that particular header at a particular location in my sd card at a particular sector in my sd card pull that header out examine all those headers and then accordingly jump to whatever entry point is specified so that's an entire flow which i'm not going to get into what i wanted to know was whether or not my code is actually executing properly the one that i've written or is there some problem because this is very very early startup code we don't have a way to actually print do any printf style debugging right that's the problem so the most basic thing that i want to do is i have to write you know basically i have to write some startup code right and say that okay the moment the rom code hands over control to my code or my startup code over here i want you to start writing some assembly and set some registers check some exception levels on arm and all of that stuff right so that is what this particular file is i hope uh, this is this is visible sorry i hope this is visible yeah is this is this clearly visible okay okay i guess it's clearly visible so basically don't worry too much about this this is just i'm writing a macro okay this is a macro then my code starts here i'll show you why it starts there and all 
I write my reset uh, function. I basically say, basically jump to this particular macro and then run the macro. If it doesn't work out, then just go into, you know, eternal sleep. Basically, that's the ARM instruction for wait for event, which means just wait. You have whatever needs to be done has not been done. So there's no need to go any more, any further. But if something, if everything goes well, then you will jump over to master CPU. That means the core that on which I'm actually executing. And then I check, these are some extra things. I check uh, what's called the system control uh, register, which allows me to check a number of things because it's to do with system control. I'm at EL3, so I check that. Uh, I check all of these things, then I come to BSS. I BSS is a section in memory where I can store, you know, different kinds of data that I need. I'm not using it, so it doesn't matter. Then I set the stack pointer. I set the vector table address. Then I simply start, I simply jump to this particular, you know, uh, this particular function, which is called start rust. Start rust is not part of the assembly, you know, instruction that I have. And it's not part of this assembly file. Start rust is part of my main file. So I include my inline, my assembly file in the main file, number one. And then here is where I have my start underscore rust. Right, so I'm basically trying to see if I can get this code, this very, very minimal skeletal, you know, uh, implementation to run on the device. Make sense? Yeah, I guess that makes sense, right? So, because it's it's sort of simple, it's 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 the simplest way of obviously out of this a bit more that I've actually tested you know before this, uh, but since nothing was working on the hardware, let's just simply dumb it down to the very bare minimum to get something that is the smallest piece of code that you want to get running to run. I all I want to do is for me to take control of the the execution flow and move it into the Rust world. That means get into, into the Rust code. In order to do that, all I need to do is write my assembly code that sort of takes it in and then hands it off to my Rust code. The way all of this is actually laid out is through this linker script, okay? And let's just spend uh, some time on the linker script. The linker script is going to actually, you know, in memory, the layout of my program, that means where does my text section sit where does my data section sit? Where does my read-only data sit? Where does my global offset table sit? Where does my BSS sit? Where does my stack, you know, sit, start rather? All of that is sort of mentioned in this file. So when my code compiles, when I actually do cargo build release, because I've already done it, doesn't matter. It's actually going to generate a binary using this particular structure that I mentioned here. What have I mentioned? I said that there is something called, uh, so in the IMX8 chip, there are, there's an internal RAM that's present. So the main system RAM is not available yet. You need to work with the internal RAM first. And the internal RAM, I figured out from the reference manual that, uh, where's that? Okay, so this is for the IMX8 uh, Nano. In the internal RAM, you see that it is, uh, you know, this is basically the memory map. Uh, so the ROM code is all sitting over here. This is all the instructions or whatever the ROM code is. We don't have access to it. It's all there. That's all you know. We don't have any access to it. Then this portion of memory, which is from hex 900,000 to hex 900, whatever, whatever this value is, till this point, it's reserved for the ROM. That means the ROM uses this as its RAM. Then this is the other portion that's available to us to sort of get our code running. Okay, right, make sense? Yes, I'll just put this up here so that you can see it. This makes sense? Yeah, okay, makes sense. So 
uh, let's just move a little forward. Uh, now that we've done that, and I've I've already got I've still got my bootloader being sorry my DDB server running. This is the code that I just showed you. The code that I showed you is the code that I want to actually get to run on the board. So let me just dump into it and go for it. So here's the other point. When you're actually having problems with GDB, note that you know you might want to check this. So when you run your GDB program, uh, it should say that it was compiled to run uh, uh, for this particular architecture and it's running on it's the target architecture that's running for is this. So just make sure that the target is right. That means if you're targeting some other architecture and you're using some other thing, you may have problems. All right. Makes sense, right? So the first thing that you do is you basically have to connect to the GDB server. And to connect to the GDB server, this is just a bunch of commands. By the way, you must have seen this. This is uh, GDB server is opening up a bunch of different ports. Okay. It opens up uh, 3334 if you want to connect to the uh, M4 core. But it opens up 3333 if you want to connect to the zero, that is the boot core that I want to connect to. It is starting up the GDB server over there, so you can connect over there. That's what it's saying. So I'm going to go ahead and connect. Now, when I connect, I'm in, all right? So in fact, you could actually go ahead and let me just, uh, let me just uh, do this. So if I want to check all the registers, the current value of all the registers on the device as they are right now, I can check them, right? This is the whole, you know, these are the general purpose registers. This is the CPSR. This is the, you know, the fault uh, register, I guess. I don't remember the full, the full form, but anyway, this is the, uh, we've got the program status registers. We've got the exception level registers. We've got the stack pointer, program pointer, all of that. Here's the thing that's happening. At least since I've actually, I've ran out, I've run out of time. I'm going to sort of walk you through this a little bit and uh, close the stream because I don't want it to be too long uh, and you know take up too much of your time as well. So that's so you, you're clearly seeing that we are now we've established a, a GDB connection and we are able to now debug or rather at least interrogate exactly what's running, what's happening on the board right now. So right now the board in its current state, the values of its the uh, the ARM Cortex A53 Core zeros uh, registers are this. Okay, so now I'm going to load my file, or my binary that I've just provided as the input initially. You already saw that I provided as the input, which is this one. Uh, I'm going to load it. So I've now loaded it. It automatically loads into the particular address that I have provided it beforehand. Okay. Now, just to confirm that, you know, the address over there is the same one, I can actually start examining memory as well. So let's say I want to look at, uh, sorry, I want to look at, you know, whatever's at that address because I just loaded something, right? See, that's the value over there. Now, if I was to open up a new tab and sort of do a hex dump, of because uh, I just created this bin file. If I was to do that, you will see that the value is the same, right? Makes sense, right? So let me just go back. Right? So this is D5 3800A0. You have to read it, you know, in reverse order because it's little Indian. Uh, so D5-3800-A0, right? So far so good? Questions? All right. So I've managed to A, connect uh, a debugger, a hardware debugger to my board. I've managed to halt execution. I've managed to load my, uh, you know, whatever application that I want to load and I've started to run. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm yet to run. So one of the things that I can do is I can basically go ahead and set the stack pointer and all of that. But you know, that's not important right now. So because if I was to just uh, 
how to do this. Right now, my, my program counter is set to zero, which is not going to work because zero is not the address my program counter needs to point to. Uh, if I was to look at my stack pointer, my stack pointer is pointing to somewhere 90EE60. Okay. It's sort of pointing somewhere. So given this is my, you know, scenario, I can clearly see that there's something wrong or something that I don't understand about this board where uh, when I load my uh, code, when I actually hit run. So if I, if I do run or R is the same thing. If I do R and I actually do Y, I'm supposed to be debugging, but I'm sort of getting, you know, an exception. If you see over here, it's completely reset itself. Right? Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, does that make sense? Okay. All right. So cool. Um, but you've noticed something. At least we were able to do a couple of things. So if I if I just stop this over here and I take my registers, I can clearly see that my program counter is at this particular address. Now, what was the address space that you saw when you actually looked at the memory map? Which is this memory map, if you look at the address space, it's from, you know, 000, all the way till three FFFF. And this particular, let me just print out uh, the program counter again. Uh, I can sort of do this, right? No, uh, I'll just print the program counter out. So the program counters value, the contents of the program counter is pointing to this particular memory address. This particular memory address is in this range. It's not in this range. Right? Right? So in my case, what's actually has actually happening is we need to figure out how do you actually transfer, you know, load your um, whatever your binary is that you've written in Rust. You've managed to go ahead and load it into memory. It's loaded in the right place, but you are unable to get to uh, you're unable to go ahead and transfer the PC, the program counter to that address and start executing for some reason. So you need to sort of figure that out why and how to do that. That is the first step that I need to do. Once I get a hold of that, then I will be in a position to say, okay, where exactly is my bug in the code that I have written uh, without the hardware debugger. All right. So I hope this sort of gives you I know that we started out from like the high level overview of the JTAG and all the way till this point, it might be quite a few points for people who are, who may have not at all come across this. And for people who've worked with the JTAG, this might have provided a little bit of useful information here and there. Uh, so I, without taking too much time, I think we're eight minutes over. Any questions, any final questions on this? Right. Let me ask the other chat as well. Uh, yeah, there's a question from Shafali. What is your advice for beginners in this domain? Um, you mean particularly in the embedded domain or with respect to uh, something like hardware debugging as such. Okay, I'll sort of take that question from the hardware debugging perspective. Uh, so it's not much. You basically uh, look at the A, you know, documentation is the biggest problem that I see when you talk about understanding how things work. And more often than not, even, uh, okay, question is about embedded. So 
for getting started in the embedded domain my suggestion is a pick a board and uh, since i can talk more about the rust piece we have very good documentation for getting started in the rust world there's a book called the rust embedded book it's an excellent book there's a number of tutorials available about the book itself and the way you can go about you know working on it so my suggestion would be to get a simple board like something like an stm32 or an nrf board a simple one doesn't cost too much uh, you don't even need to buy all these debuggers and all of that stuff because for those boards the my cortex m boards there the debug the debug probes are already present on the board you don't have to worry too much about that so you can get the board and start working through the exercises that are available on the uh, rust embedded you know thing now from there you can move into spaces like figuring out you know what kind of work you do you want to do in the embedded space do you want to work on uh the security side of things which is something that we work on quite a bit uh or you want to work on things like operating systems and uh build a product when on an on an embedded device or any of those things so i think that should probably be the place that i would recommend to get started Obviously I'm biased. I work on Rust, so that's what I would say. Hope that helps. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay, so I guess that's it. There are no other questions. Uh, I thank you guys for being here today uh, because this was supposed to be a very small short stream. None of these streams see end uh, seem to be short, at least not within. I was targeting something like forty-five minutes or thirty minutes, but it's not happening. So anyway, we'll figure it out. But thank you very much for today. And uh, in case there are any questions, please leave a comment. or reach out to us if you anyway if you want uh to learn more or have thoughts about it please feel free to uh sort of apply we have open positions as well uh in the bosch world so please go ahead and apply thank you very much have a good day